this is the report. It looks like this. Uh, and I suppose you can get hard copies for free if you just ask uh, people at Sessifo because they, are, they have loads of money and they print uh, lots of copies. <laughs> uh, so what is this EAG group? It's called European Economic Advisory Group. And it has nothing to do with the European Commission whatsoever. Uh, so it's not an emanation of the, of the European Commission, it's just a group of academics who uh, sit together and uh, try to you know, uh, reconstruct the whole world um, uh, once, uh, once a year. And um, so we are caught by the right, and, and this, this report has been a pain to write since the crisis, because of course we have to write about a lot of crises. And the crisis, and, and so, uh, well, everybody's writing about the crisis, so it's not that easy to be original or, or being original without being wrong at the same time. And, uh, and the other aspect is that whatever forecast uh, we can make, or whatever number we come up with, uh, is typically obsolete when we present the report. So these are two important shortcomings of the, of the crisis. Um, so, Okay, so these are caveats, and of course the, the third caveat, which is the usual one, is that obviously you all know much more about the Irish economy than I do. Uh, in fact, it's not difficult. And, um, <clears throat> and so I'm sure you will, call, you, will, you will catch me saying stupid things about Ireland, and I apologize. Now, <coughs> okay, so typically our report is uh, always structured the same way. There is an initial long and boring chapter that uh, uh, nobody reads about the macroeconomic outlook, but it's uh, always the one that comes out in the media, so I don't know how they do it. Uh, and then there are very interesting chapters following this one that, nobody, that everybody reads, but they never talk about it in the media. And the, the chapters are on various topics, and there are uh, typically too many of them, but this year, they are more, they, all the chapters have to do with the crisis. Okay, they, uh, and in fact, with the exit of the crisis, which is the perspective of this year. So what is the, what is our, the macroeconomic outlook? This is, in, in some sense, uh, chapter one, in some sense, is the official forecast of the German IFO Institute, which is one of the six official big institutes of, uh, of Germany. And we comment on this four case, the commentary of EAG on that, on that forecast. Um, so if I uh, uh, can summarize it in a few words, uh, we point to a moderate uh, recovery in 2010. Um, uh, we are somewhat more pessimistic than other uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, and that's because we believe that th this recovery is fragile for, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so here are some uh, uh, pictures. Um, so what, what the IFO does is asking you know, prominent uh, businesses worldwide what their prospects are. So they have their own da database, if you want. And so they end up with uh, uh, an indicator of economic climate, which has proved to be pretty reliable, and this is the red line that you can see here, and clearly uh, this, uh, this indicator of economic climate points to a, uh, uh, to a recovery, right? And uh, similarly, for the world, and that's for the world, okay? So a lot of this comes from China and India that are clearly uh, back to the pretty uh, high growth path. Um, uh, and so we expect uh, a growth rate for the world economy of 3% in, uh, in 2010. Uh, now if we decompose this between uh, various areas, um, then you know, the assessment of the economic situation um, has, uh, 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 is actually much better for the emerging economy. Than economies than for the developed economies. So it looks like the recovery is coming from the emerging economies and not so much from, um, uh, from the OECD area. 
And it's still the case that if I look, if you look at this survey, we are still below the horizontal line, right? So although we are going up pretty pretty quickly, but we are still, and the mood is the same as in the post September 11 uh, economy. Now this is the forecast of economic growth by region. So uh, uh, and then um, there is actually a good recovery for the U.S., which is, uh, which is being uh, forecasted. Um, uh, while uh, uh, Europe is not, doing, uh, uh, is not doing so well. Um, and so the growth rate forecasted... For, okay, yeah, I, sorry, I was confused. But, because this was in contradiction with what I just said. But in fact, the gap between China and the rest of us is so huge that uh, China can be read on the right scale. So in fact, the curve for China is not below, is not at the same level as the curve. The China is much above. Okay. And now I feel better. <laughs> and so, uh, well, I feel better. I feel more consistent with what I just said. Um, and so the US is doing, you know, okay, but not that great, 2%. And European Union, okay, it's a recovery, but it's just 1%. So that's not a very optimistic forecast. I believe that other forecasts that are around are actually more optimistic than, than ours. And so why is it that we are not uh, optimistic? Well, we are optimistic but cautious. Uh, uh, we have four reasons to be cautious. The first thing is that well, during the last two years, we have made everybody talks about the financial sector, etc. So we have made some effort to actually measure the extent of the credit crunch. Because when you open the newspapers, they tell you about the credit crunch. However, when you look at measures of the amount of credit, you know, flow, etc., it's not actually going down. If anything, it's stubby, it's st it stops growing. But it's hard to call this a credit crunch. Okay? If you look at surveys of firms reporting on their difficulties to borrow, well, the, the proportion of firms that say that it's their problem has gone up a little bit, but not by much, and it's still a minority of firms. So there is no, not that much evidence of a credit crunch. Well, that may be because you know, if you don't invest, you don't need credit anyway. And so we have not seen the credit crunch yet. And we may be in a situation where, the, where, the, where in fact, credit constraints are going to kick in as the economy recovers, uh, firms trying to invest will find that they have trouble uh, finding loans. So that's our uh, 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 first caveat. <coughs> caveat number two, the capacity utilization is, uh, is low, which means that it, we are still going to have to wait till we see a recovery of, uh, of investment. Caveat number three, there is this annoying thing called unemployment. And um, uh, unemployment has the bad taste of lagging the business cycle. And so when you start recovering, when GDP starts recovering, unemployment uh, 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 continues to grow. And it will bottom out before, well, after. Uh, uh, it will, yeah, sorry, it will reach its peak after the, the uh, trough of GDP. And, um, and this makes us a little bit nervous because, of course, the unemployed, they, are, they don't want to consume a lot. And so uh, unemployment, inherited uh, unemployment, um, may still act as a drag on aggregate demand. <coughs> and, uh, um, and the fourth reason why we are cautious, cautious is that, and we, we elaborate on that later in the report, is that fiscal stimulus cannot be maintained very long, because uh, as the example, as the debate on Greece shows, for example, um, um, uh, we are worried about the accumulation of public debt, and some adjustment <coughs> has to take place. And so, it's possible that the adjustment uh, also puts a drag on growth because you have to increase taxes and so forth. So these are the, the reasons why we are cautious on the. Uh, uh, under recovery. So we see that, you know, for example, this is uh, 
This is investment, and investment is not uh, uh, is not recovering uh, is not recovering much. And this uh, this gives you the rise the rise in unemployment in uh, uh, well in the US where it, where it has been very sharp, the UK the euro area where it's substantial, and uh, and, and Japan. So we still. It's still not clear that unemployment has reached uh, its, um, uh, its peak. So this is this illustrates what I said. Okay, it's always uh, it always comes as a surprise to me. Uh, we all talk about the financial crisis, and this is a survey of firms telling that they have. Uh, that their production is limited by financial factors, and you just get a very minor blip. Uh, well, no, sorry, this is in construction. Um, so we get an increase. Okay, we get an increase. Well, no, I mean, no, we get nothing. Right? Sorry. Um, in fact, it looks like it's demand constraints that are uh, limiting construction. Mm. Okay, so it's very difficult to see <coughs> this. Uh, credit crunch. And the reason why it's surprising is that in the back of our mind we have, since everybody calls it a financial crisis and since everybody says it should be transmitted to the private, uh, to the real economy, <coughs> there must be some mechanism, right? And if it starts, if it originates in the financial sector, we would expect that the mechanism is financial constraints. And we find very little evidence on that, uh, uh, of that. Excuse me, how, how do you define financial constraints? Oh, here, well, that's just um, a survey. So, you know, they tick a box saying it's financial constraints. So what does it mean? It is worth what, is, what this indicator is worth. Uh, I agree. Uh, Probably not. Well, maybe it means nothing. That's possible. Yeah. Uh, but it does not go up, right? So this is uh, another indicator. And... Um, of credit constraints, which asks uh, a more precise question about the you know, restrictive willingness of banks to lend. And you find more action there, but still, um, you know, the level of the constraint is, uh, that's for Germany, the level of the constraint is not higher than in 2003. So there is action, but not, not, not as much as you would uh, as you be. Okay, so this is if you want the financial constraints. We don't we don't see that much of them, but is it, but that's more, uh, that's presumably because demand is low. Um, now, how about the fiscal front? So this is illustrated here. We have a massive increase in the budget deficit of. Uh, of developed countries, um, mostly in the, in the United States, well, you know, it's 10, 12 percent of GDP, and furthermore, it is <coughs> forecast to continue into 2010, 2000, uh, 2011, and of course, that, that's a very large number, right? It's, um, I always say, it's a sort of banana republic uh, uh, figure. <coughs> And uh, the euro area has more diversity of experiences, but in Ireland it's not uh, <laughs> particularly encouraging. But uh, many countries have still lower deficits than, uh, than in the US, so on average the deficit is in fact you know, 6% uh, in the euro area, which is uh, not so surprising given the macroeconomic uh, circumstances. Okay. Um, so this, if you want, is, uh, is chapter one of the report. Then there is a chapter two of the report, which is very interesting, but I'm not going to, to talk very much about it. Um, it is a sort of journey into the collapse of, uh, of trust. So it's a pure financial chapter. Uh, it's a journey into the collapse of trust in financial intermediaries uh, and in the financial markets. Uh, throughout uh, the, developed, uh, the developed world. And the idea is to document the, uh, the fall in trust and to, uh, and to say that um, um, 
this has this has to be taken into account by policymakers. If you cannot rebuild trust, you can do lots of reforms and regulations, but you still have uh, uh, you have to rebuild trust. Uh, and then we we make some proposals about how trust could be uh, uh, could be rebuilt. And finally, well, finally, the, the last three chapters talk about uh, more specifically the macroeconomic challenges that uh, uh, the developed economies face with respect to uh, the exit strategy of, uh, of the crisis. So there is uh, one chapter about, uh, um, about uh, fiscal consolidation, one chapter about the sustainability of, uh, of the US, and um, finally a, a chapter on the impact of the crisis on the Eurozone. So, as we, as we all know, in the, uh, 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 most countries have um, uh, implemented uh, large stimulus uh, policies, although a lot of the deficits uh, that are being experienced come from the automatic stabilizers, and of course they also come from the fact that in many countries there was already a deficit to begin with, before the crisis. And so all this means that we are currently in a situation of uh, uh, quickly deteriorating public finances. Um, and the question is, you know, uh, uh, should we worry about it? What should we do about it? And also, uh, is it worth it? Okay? Now, um, well, in many countries, we see that the debt GDP ratio is rapidly approaching 100%. In Greece, it's already above that. In Italy, it's also above that. And in France, we are sort of moving towards the sort of 100% club, although at a low. not now, but if we continue, that, that, will, be, that will be the case, and, uh, and so on. Um, so is 100% the magic number, or you know, can, we, can we live with it? This is the question that, um, that we ask. So, here we have a table that shows that, in principle, the discretionary fiscal <coughs> measures is about you know, from 1% to 2% of GDP, depending on which country we look at. In fact, uh, yeah, Ireland, we get 0.5 here. Uh, you tell me if this is correct. Um, but nevertheless, we have this, we have this large, uh, we have this large uh, deficit with the US, Ireland, Ireland and Greece being, being the being in the top league, um, Germany, Austria, and Netherlands being a bit sort of a normal experience, and then uh, France, Portugal, Italy, and Belgium having pretty large deficit, especially considering that all these countries have a pretty high debt to, to begin with. Um, okay, and, and here you have this. Uh, um, the GDP ratio that vary a lot across countries. In Ireland, um, you know, the initial conditions in Ireland are quite favorable, but you can see that it can go up very quickly. In fact, it's forecasted to move to 80% in 2010 uh, of GDP. Well, not least because GDP is, is falling, so of course that does not help. Um, now, whereas in only 2007, <coughs> Uh, Ireland was at 25%. So these things can deteriorate very quickly. Um, in France, it deteriorated very quickly during the 90s. There was uh, the recession of the 90s. It never recovered since then. And now we are in for a new round where we are at 68 and it's forecast to be at 86 in, in 2000. Um, okay, so most countries... Um, are, uh, not all, but most countries have uh, rapidly deteriorating uh, public finances. So one question we ask in this chapter is, why are we doing that? It's just, uh, is it like the, the dance of the rain, or you know, some magic, uh, magic incantation, or is it worth it? Now, um, <coughs> here I am a bit schizophrenic, in the sense that there are some reasons to believe that it's worth it, on the other hand, um, it's not so clear that um, we get a lot of recovery out of it and, you know, at face value. But in principle, 
we, sh we should get some action. Uh, and, our, and what we say is the following. Um, well, the, the sort of um, magic, well, the sort of object which we care about is the Keynesian multiplier, which tells you how much GDP you get out of one euro of public expenditure. Um, now, in fact, the estimates of that multiplier, now, there is a big literature of papers that don't agree with, uh, between themselves about it, but uh, quite often it's not very encouraging, which means that your pre if you want to pick up your preferred estimate, it would be around one, which means that if I pay somebody to dig a hole in the ground and give that person one euro, GDP increases by one euro by exactly the hole that has been digged in the ground. Um, that's not very encouraging because the whole argument is that there are spillover effects from public expenditures to income of the private sector to private demand uh, so that you actually get more stimulus than, than one euro. However, there are reasons to believe that in current circumstances, uh, uh, the Keynesian multiplier should be higher because, first of all, um, one of the reasons why there are some you know, uh, crowding out effects is that um, uh, uh, interest rates may go up uh, as a result of the increase in public expenditures and this reduces private investment. But here we are near a liquidity trap, <coughs> very low interest rates, and, there, and it's unlikely that they would go up as uh, soon as a response to, to, to growth. And so that source of crowding out would, um, uh, uh, should be eliminated. I mean, sh should not, should not uh, come into play in the current situation. And second, uh, one of the reasons they are crowding out is that there are consumers who take into account the future and they only consume a small amount of the extra income. Uh, I give you one euro to dig a hole in the ground you spend 20 cents and the rest of it you, you save. Okay? But if you, are, if you have credit constraints, then a lot of people are in a situation where they would like to consume more, but they can't, and therefore they would spend all of the additional income. And this would tend also to increase the uh, Keynesian multiplier. Um, so we have these two effects that we believe are more, more uh, relevant uh, in sharp recessions like this one, and therefore we should expect that, that uh, uh, the Keynesian multiplier currently is relatively high. Okay. Excuse me, yes. again, getting back to, to financial concerns, I mean, you were saying earlier that there didn't seem to be financial Yes, yeah, right, right. And right. now you're saying there are credit yeah. constraints. So there are credit constraints in theory, right? We have a, yeah, the Anglo-Saxon always makes fun of the French one. Uh, they are, uh, French saying is, uh, okay, it's true in practice, but is it true in theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in theory, there are credit constraints. Just when we, when we look at them in the data, we, don't, we do not find them, right? I mean, we do not find them. We don't find, it's not that we do not find them, it's that we don't find as much uh, deterioration on that front as uh, one might think, okay? Um, but these were data on firms. We, we would also need to look at households because a lot of, the Canadian multiplier goes through private consumption, right? Um, so presumably in countries like the United States, there are right now a lot of households, households that have uh, credit constraints. At least it's, pro it's plausible, right? People who have, who have had foreclosures and, and so forth. Uh, uh, but anyway... <coughs> My stance here is, is cautious because uh, uh, there is another thing going on, which is that if you increase public debt rapidly, then people are going to expect high taxes in the future, and this will uh, reduce the Keynesian multiplier because they will tend to save uh, in expectation of the future high taxes. So there are these effects, but you know, uh, uh, I tend to believe that you can get a high Keynesian multiplier with a 5% budget deficit, but with a 10% budget deficit, these effects of expectations start being strong and tend to reduce your Keynesian multiplier. Which means, in some sense, that 
Many countries have done all they could in terms of stimulus and perhaps have gone too far in letting the, 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 the budget deficit increase. And uh, there's not much more that can be done. So this is one question. The second question, what will happen in the long term? Um, now, I guess there are two extreme views. There is the extreme view of the popular uh, writer who does not know more about, much about economics and who would say, look, it's a catastrophe, you know, debt is exploding. Um, and then there is uh, the opposite view of the old-style macroeconomics textbooks where you show your credentials, uh, your academic credentials by ignoring altogether the fact that deficits have to be reimbursed in the future because the basic models that, are, that have been taught for a while totally ignore uh, the uh, government's uh, budget constraints. Well, here we are somewhere in the middle since we are reasonable economists. And, um, and what we say is that um, while well, the current fiscal stance may prove sustainable, provided there is enough growth, so if, if growth resumes at reasonable levels, and pro provided interest rates remain low. Okay? And we do some back-of-the-envelope computations that allow us to have some scenarios. Um, Currently, the cost of servicing a debt GDP ratio of 80% is about 3% of GDP, which is not negligible, right? Because uh, if you have uh, government consumption, which is 20% of GDP, that's, uh, uh, that's when uh, you know how to compute better than me. 15%, 15% of public expenditures that are devoted to servicing the debt. Um, but it's not the end of the world, right? I mean, anybody can, can reduce their <coughs> expenditures by that um, amount. And so, um, if, for example, we have 2% real growth, and if, um, uh, and if public expenditures are growing a little bit than 2% because of progressivity in, uh, in, in income taxes and so forth, then we could have the EU debt could stabilize at 100% of GDP in 2017, and then you know have a return to fiscal balance. So this is one scenario that uh, um, uh, that we can have. It's not a rosy scenario. You know, it's not funny to live in a world with 100% debt GDP ratio, but it is sustainable. Of course, there are caveats. Uh, 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 first, it's not granted that interest rates will remain so low. Interest rates may rise. Uh, first, they may rise because they are historically low, and at some point, uh, they may be driven up by higher returns elsewhere, in China, in India, places Brazil, places like that. And second, uh, as we have seen in the Greek case, and to some extent in Ireland, uh, if markets doubt the repayment ability of some governments, um, uh, then of course the interest rate uh, in, on the debt increases, and that, um, and of course that makes the debt itself less sustainable. So in some sense, it's self-fulfilling. The more it may be self-fulfilling, if people expect you, you know, not to repay your debt, you have uh, you can uh, you can pay one or two points more on your debt. Uh, in terms of interest, and your debt will accumulate much faster, which means that ex post, you might well not reimburse it. Um, so this is caveat number one. Caveat number two, growth may continue to be low, and um, you know, our forecast is 1%. Uh, the scenario I just discussed is 2%. And there was one thing people talked about a lot before the crisis, the so-called structural reforms. Now, I don't know how uh, the debate is in Ireland, but in France, nobody talks about structural reforms any longer. People talk about the grand emprunt, the big loan, which is about you know, spending a lot of public money. Um, so this sort of agenda has been put uh, at the back of the mind of, of, of many people. Um, uh, I think... Now we are in 2010, so everybody must make a joke of the Lisbon strategy by now. Uh, 
But uh, that was supposed to increase growth, right? And uh, not much has been done, and, and, and so this gives us uh, grounds to be worried about whether our growth is going to be high. And second, uh, as debt piles up, of course, you expect high tax rates, which is not going to be very good for growth. You know? uh, am I going to invest in that place if, uh, if uh, I anticipate that there will be some tax on capital income in order to pay for the high public debt? And so this, in turn, is not very, is not very good. Uh, it's not very good for growth. So, so this is the famous graph about the spreads, which uh, is extremely surprising because what was going on until very recently is that the euro, which was costly in terms of, you know, imbalances and competitiveness problem, on the other hand, was a bonanza for many countries in terms of. Uh, uh, how to finance their debt. Uh, uh, and the reason is that now your debt is denominated in a credible currency, the euro, and so you can finance it at interest rates that are very close to the, to the German bonds. Um, uh, and suddenly, in, during the crisis, it looks like the markets uh, changed their mind. And uh, there were spreads that of several hundred basis points applied uh, uh, to uh, tenure government debt, which, uh, which is incredible because what can it mean? Um, it means that it cannot mean that you're going to devalue, right, uh, and that the value of those bonds is going to fall because you are in the eurozone. So uh, that's highly implausible. Um, but then uh, it, it could mean that um, the markets expect the government to at least partially default on its date, which is also, uh, by historical standards, very hard to believe. Uh, uh, these things happen after a war or in really exceptional uh, circumstances. So where do these very, these very high spreads um, uh, come from? Um, I don't know. At least in the case of Greece, um, you know, it's it's plausible that uh, scenarios where Greece is just unable to repay its debt because uh, growth is very low and its ability to raise taxes is very, additional taxes is very low, such a scenario cannot be ruled out. And therefore, it's such a scenario that, that has been factored in by the markets when these spreads went up. In some sense, this sort of euro uh, uh, membership bonanza is a double-edged knife because you have a low cost of debt, but this also means that you are tempted to accumulate a lot of debt. And at some point, you exhaust that, that advantage, and that's presumably what happened in, in Greece. For Ireland, it's even more surprising, because Ireland starts in a much better situation than Greece in terms of the initial level of public debt, as we have seen, and also in terms of uh, growth prospects, uh, Ireland is better, at least if we look at the external sector, well, bo both Ireland and Greece are small economies, so the export sector is very important, and as you will see later, there's a big difference between the two countries, because Greece, like Spain and like Portugal, has accumulated very substantial trade deficits, which suggests that uh, um, it is overpriced, and that if it were not a member of the euro, it should and would devalue. But that's not the case for Ireland, which in terms of balance of trade, at least, I know a lot of money is getting out because there are lots of foreign capital here, but in terms of balance of trade, which is what matters for GDP, even though for GNP the story is different, uh, then there is no problem in Ireland. If anything, there is big surplus. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, Ireland is in green, which is proper, I suppose. And, uh, and in fact, the spreads were, were very high. And now, uh, um, well, now these spreads have come down a little bit, but they are still quite high compared to the pre-crisis pre -crisis situation. So it's clear that markets have changed their mind with respect to that whole, uh, to that whole issue. Um, so in some sense, um, so these are the caveats, if you want. There are scenarios such that the fiscal sustainability uh, become, becomes a problem. Now, chapter four is more uh, precisely uh, concerned with the, with the US. 
Now, people were concerned with the U.S. before the crisis, because before the crisis, the U.S. was in a situation... Uh, I read, I'm really sorry. Okay. Um, right, so, so people were concerned about, uh, about the U.S. because of what was called the global imbalances, which is that um, uh, the uh, U.S. consumption level was very high, uh, public expenditures were pretty high with already uh, budget deficits of the, of the Bush era. Uh, so the U.S. was spending a lot, and um, that was financed by um, importing capital from China, Russia, oil producers, um, uh, and Japan. And so before the crisis, people were concerned about these global imbalances, and there was this anticipation that there might be a hard landing of the U.S. economy with a sharp fall in consumption, sharp depreciation uh, of the U.S. dollar, uh, which would amount to a, uh, uh, which would be <coughs> contractionary, unless there would be very smooth adjustment of the economy, but these things don't happen. So, so there was one hard landing scenario. Um, now, of course, during the crisis, people stopped talking uh, about these global imbalances, but in some sense, the crisis has not improved them, if anything, because uh, the, strategy, the U.S. strategy of combating the crisis was based on public demand um, uh, uh, replacing private demand. So, private consumption was too high, and now you know, total, total expenditures are still too high, but it's more public expenditures rather than private expenditures. Of course, this does nothing to solve the global imbalances. It's still the case that the U.S. runs a trade deficit, and of course, it aggravates uh, the public deficit. So, so the U.S. imbalances are, if anything, they are aggravated, uh, they are aggravated by the crisis. So if we look at fiscal sustainability, uh, there we are less optimistic than in the preceding chapter because in some sense the U.S. is at the extreme of the spectrum uh, of, uh, of fiscal problems. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office projects substantial deficits uh, well, in, well into the future. We also know that there are uh, problems of uh, solvency of the the social security uh, system, and therefore um, we think that um, uh, a substantial adjustment is needed rather, 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 rather soon. Right? So this, is, this tells you how fast the Congressional Budget Office changes its mind. The blue line is what was forecast evolution of the federal net debt before the crisis, and the red line is how this has been revised in 2009. Okay, so this is quite striking. And, uh, uh, and then we get this permanent increase. Um, similarly, as far as the deficit is concerned, it's, uh, um, we have this big increase and it's forecast to be in deficit forever, right? Almost. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, the, this is the prospects for social security. Uh, so, so, in some sense, we have this sort of uh, mildly optimistic scenario for Europe, but we are somewhat... But in the US case, we think that more effort will have to be made because of... Uh, because of those, uh, of those prospects. <coughs> now, what about trade? Uh, before the crisis, the U.S. trade deficit was almost the motor of the world economy. It was 6% of U.S. GDP, which means 2% of the world economy was the U.S. deficit. Uh, and of course, uh, simple calculations uh, suggest uh, that this is unsustainable, right? And it cannot go on forever. Um, However, some economists have looked uh, into that problem with some detail, and they reached the conclusion that part of the, that this is actually, in some sense, 
overstated. The reason is that uh, the U.S. gets a greater return on the assets it, it owns uh, against the rest of the world than on the assets uh, it has sold to the rest of the world. So the U.S. is... So, so that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, fact, if you want, which is partly due to the fact that lots of... that, that the Chinese have bought lots of U.S. Treasury, treasury bills at uh, low interest rates and with a falling... Uh, with, with a weak dollar. But this is only part of the story. The other, the other part of the story is that countries like China do not have a well-developed financial infrastructure. And so in some sense, they are importing insurance and diversification from the United States. And they are uh, paying this um, with higher rates of return than the one they earn on their US Treasury bills. And so in some sense, we could redo the accounting and say, you know, part of this trade deficit is not in fact a trade deficit. It is just, uh, uh, it is just a counterpart in terms of imports of something which is being exported uh, from the U.S. to the rest of the world, which is the financial services uh, <coughs> that uh, um, are produced by the U.S. financial industry. Now, of course, um, that's interesting because, because we have a financial crisis, and therefore it's not totally obvious that uh, these financial services are going to remain after the crisis, uh, because of the, uh, of the likely you know, shrinkage of the financial industry and the return to more basic financial instruments. So, uh, so it's quite... So, so therefore, what we say is that if the return privilege of the U.S. continues, then in fact, the adjustment that, is, that it must make to its balance of trade is not at large. It's like two, three points of GDP, not six points of GDP. But on the, on the other hand, it's possible that the conditions that made the return privilege possible disappear after the crisis. And in which, in which case, of course, the adjustment um, that uh, is necessary will be, will be larger. It will be of the order of magnitude of the, of the trade deficit uh, prior to the crisis. So, so this chapter says, look, you know, there, there will be a substantial financial ad uh, fiscal adjustment in the U.S. Uh, on the other hand, for the external balance of the U.S., things are more complex than they apparently look. Uh, <coughs> Well, finally, chapter five is a discussion of the impact of the crisis on, uh, on the Eurozone. So in our view, there are three challenges uh, posed by the crisis on, uh, on the Euro area. One, one thing that may happen is that uh, there is a potential destabilizing effect of the crisis on the Euro exchange rate. Although Right now, it does not seem that this scenario is, uh, is that likely. Uh, in fact, the troubles of Greece in that, in that sense uh, are somewhat of a blessing because it tends to depress the euro, and the euro tended to be a bit too high uh, before that episode. And therefore, um, in some sense, the Greek episode is... Uh, is, has a stabilizing effect on the euro exchange rate, even though, uh, so far, let's see. <laughs> if there is contagion, it would be, you know, we go in the other, other direction. Um, well, then the second thing that we talk about is uh, the fact that there are uh, diverging macroeconomic trends within the euro areas, and these are a slow, this is a slow divergence phenomenon, but it is of some worry, because these, these countries share the same currency, and we would like to know um, how the crisis affects this divergence. And um, we tend to say that it's more or less independent of this divergence, but of course, it, if it makes you 
more miserable, uh, then um, you might worry more about, about it than if you were affluent. And, and, uh, and, and thirdly, we discuss, um, what I, we discuss whether the euro has acted as a safe haven um, uh, in response uh, by, by, by preventing uh, member countries from being hit by balance of payment crisis in the same fashion as Iceland, uh, Latvia, or, or Hungary. So is, is the euro a good thing uh, in, that, in that respect? Um, okay. So now, uh, I don't have any slides about, um, about the euro exchange rate, but the, the the worry was that, you know, if, if market participants get nervous about the U.S. dollar because of a large size of the U.S. deficits, because of very low interest rates in, in the U.S., then there could be a, a switch out of U.S. assets uh, into euro assets that would further push up the value of the euro. And given that it was already quite high, uh, this would create severe problems. Okay? But fortunately, in some sense, the euro uh, area fiscal situation is not much better than that of the U.S. Uh, and, um, and in some sense, this, of course, reduces incentives of market participants to get out of the U.S. into the eurozone, because after all, we are not doing much better. And so, if anything, in recent uh, months, uh, there has been this worry about, uh, about Greece. And so, if anything, so far, we are moving in the opposite direction. So in the report, um, we say that it's not very pro. In the report, we don't put a lot of weight on a scenario of you know, the euro becoming really too high because of a big collapse, because of a collapse of the dollar. Uh, but that was before uh, the current situation, and the current situation makes this scenario even, le even less likely. Now, uh, how about this, this uh, divergences? Uh, well, there are divergences in a number of uh, areas um, between uh, Eurozone countries, um, first between the core countries, and also uh, between the periphery countries that are even, of course, more asymmetrical than the core countries. One important divergence is uh, the balance of trade. And this is uh, illustrated here. Since the common currency was adopted, then Germany is accumulating trade surpluses. And some countries, in particular Spain, are accumulating trade deficits. And these are quite large relative to the size of their economies. Then Italy is more or less uh, balanced. And France has been balanced for a while, but it is sort of you know, consistently deteriorating. And of course, none of these countries can correct those deficits by devaluing. So if the divergences continue to pile up, uh, 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 that is going to be, to be trouble. Now, in some sense, uh, uh, this graph tells you that the crisis is not making these things worse. If anything, it is pointing in the other direction. Uh, Germany, not for reasons that are to rejoice about, but uh, Spain has a very substantial uh, recession, so it is importing less. So that's helping its trade balance. Positive side effect of a very negative thing. And Germany faces less demand from the rest of the world, so it's exporting less. And this tends to correct its, uh, its trade surplus. So, so there is no reason. So the, so the crisis, if, if anything, is helping in that, in that dimension. Now, peripheral countries have a more extreme experience. Uh, countries like Portugal and Greece are in very big, uh, 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 have a very big uh, imbalance. And Ireland is doing very well in terms of exports. But of course, then you have to, to, uh, exports, uh, to export a lot of you know, uh, payments to the rest of the world. But in terms of goods and services, uh, Ireland. Uh, exports a lot. 
Uh, and, and in that uh, <coughs> dimension, we don't see we don't see much going on. There is not much effect on, on the crisis, but this suggests uh, that uh, these imbalances are even more worrisome for the uh, peripheral countries. And of course, these are the countries that uh, people talk about uh, right now. And of course, one reason, one important source of these imbalances is divergences in inflation rates uh, um, that themselves are the, partly the byproduct of divergences in uh, business cycle conditions and, and, uh, and uh, growth conditions. For example, in Spain, there has been you know, a very strong expansion until, uh, until the crisis, and this, ex this expansion was not very healthy. Uh, it was associated with uh, a positive inflation differential compared to other countries. And, and this higher inflation, given that Spain has the same rate of interest rate as the rest of the Eurozone, meant that real interest rates were even lower in Spain than elsewhere. And so this, country, this continued to fuel the boom. And it's not clear that uh, you wanted such a boom. Maybe you wanted to cool down the Spanish economy, but you couldn't. It, uh, because you don't have... Well, actually, you could use a fiscal policy, but they, they didn't want to do it. Maybe they were wrong. Uh, and I think that part also uh, of the problem with low interest rates is that some sectors are more elastic to real interest rates than others, and in particular construction, in Spain, uh, uh, there was an excess investment in construction, which I believe is in part due to this low interest rate. And the result of all this is that uh, uh, the Spanish economy has been a little bit you know, overheating, uh, at least enough to accumulate these uh, inflation differentials that are now, of course, problematic because it should reallocate its resources to the export sector, but it has uh, competitiveness, competitiveness problems. And if you look at the ranking of these countries by the inflation uh, rate, it's exactly the, country, the ranking, uh, their ranking by the trade balance. Okay? And, and these gaps, these differentials uh, have been widening but in fact, with the crisis, we all have more or less zero inflation right now, so it's, it has been uh, stabilized. Now, how about the safe haven argument? Well, there, there I believe there is something to be said in favor of the euro, which is that um, uh, there are many episodes of self-fulfilling balance of payments crisis that are due to the fact that you are borrowed in foreign currency. Because if you are borrowed in foreign currency, and if people, if uh, market participants, if speculators uh, anticipate that your currency is going to depreciate, then uh, they anticipate that there will be a solvency problem after the depreciation of your currency. Uh, because you are borrowed in foreign currency. And, of course, this may trigger a pure self-fulfilling balance of payment crisis, which is not um, justified by economic fundamentals. Because everybody expects you to be unable to repay your foreign denominated debt, then people want to withdraw their assets before everybody else, and this creates a crisis. Um, and uh, many countries, well, of course, the U.S. is privileged in that respect because it does borrow in its own currency. So uh, it is immune to those uh, issues, but many small open economies, of course, may have those crises, like it's what happened in Iceland. And if you're a member of the euro area, this cannot happen. Okay? Because your currency is the euro, so you borrow in euros. And so I suppose that uh, the reason why we have uh, not seeing the Icelandic scenario taking place for countries of the Eurozone is this uh, safe haven effect. 
However, the safe haven is not, uh, uh, is not perfect. There are some problems. Well, one, one problem is that um, some member countries suffer from large depreciation in, uh, of the currencies of non-member countries that are contiguous. Um, for example, the, uh, for example, Finland trades a lot with Sweden, and the Swedish krona has depreciated. This makes this creates problems for Finland. Ireland trades to, with uh, uh, the UK, and the sterling has depreciated, and this may mean trouble for uh, for Ireland. Well, second, there is a sort of grey zone of countries that have not, are not members of the euro area, but they, they plan to join, and they try to beg to, beg to the euro, uh, and the crisis has created, uh, uh, especially in Latvia, very adverse macroeconomic developments there, and this, of course, uh, uh, jeopardizes their commitment to a peg to the euro. So they, are, they have the dilemma of, you know, increasing their interest rates by a lot to defend their currency and falling deeper in recession, or uh, um, devaluing their currency, but then they can run into this problem of uh, uh, revaluation of their uh, debt in euros and, and, and the bond. And finally, the third problem is that, in some sense, a number of countries have, have tested the safe haven to too much, and they have put themselves in a situation where, despite the fact that they have borrowed in euros, uh, markets are nervous about their ability uh, to repay. Um, first, because they have borrowed a lot, and second, because it it is con their ability to repay is contingent on uh, having good macroeconomic conditions in the future, and therefore being uh, able to levy sufficiently high taxes to reimburse their debt. And this is, not, uh, this is not granted. In particular, in the case of Greece and Portugal, we have seen uh, that they are not very competitive, and therefore, why should, why should I, if I hold uh, Greek uh, public debt, why should I expect it to be able to have a sound tax base in the future, given that you know, people in the rest of the world do not want to buy Greek products? So this, is the, this graph tells you a little bit about the depreciation argument. The krona is depreciated by 10% and the sterling by 25%. So Irish goods are more expensive to buy by 25% uh, for the British than they used to be. Except that there is an ongoing debate in economics about what we call pricing to markets, which is that the prices react a lot to exchange. There is a lot of uh, adjustment of prices. So I suppose a lot of Irish exporters have reduced their prices in the UK. <coughs> and of course, it reduces their profitability. OK, these are a number of, OK, these are some data on what's going on what, what in Latvia and, and uh, Hungary. Uh, this is the same picture on spreads. And finally, we have a difficult exercise. So we have been challenged by Hans Werner Zinn, who is the director of SACIFO and member of our group, to take a stance about what should we do about Greece. Um, of course, it's difficult to take such a stand, but there are a number of possibilities that one uh, can consider. The idea being that um, if there is outside help, of course, it should be associated with um, conditionality. Uh, there should be a quid pro quo. Uh, Greece should be virtuous. And the question is, who should do it? <laughs> well, so if there is no conditionality, this is option number one, then of course this is what the, makes the Germans uh, uh, scream, you, you reward bad behavior 
And then, of course, no, no country in the Eurozone will have an incentive to uh, have a sound fiscal policy. They will just wait for being in trouble and being bailed out. So that's the moral hazard problem. Then, possibility number two, a conditional bailout by the EU. And there we uh, tend to believe that the EU would be both judge and party. The EU would be so eager for the scheme to work that uh, it would actually not, uh, be not be very credible in order to impose its conditions. And we, are, we have already seen with the growth and stability pact that the EU is not very good at enforcing its own, its own constraints. Third possibility would be to let uh, Greece default on its debt, but then, uh, in some sense, it would create a precedent, um, and this would have lots of costs. Um, <coughs> there could be contagion to, to other countries. Uh, then there would be an increase in rates and in spreads uh, th throughout the zone. Um, and on top of that, defaulting while remaining part of the Eurozone would, you know, it would give you a bad reputation and you will still not have, and Greece would still not have fixed its competitiveness problem. So it will, the macroeconomic issues would remain. And so finally, the sort of consensus uh, uh, suggestion uh, in our group is that maybe the best solution for Greece would be to have a sort of IMF program, or the, enf the enforcer of conditionality would be, would be the IMF. Okay. And this closes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.